Hi, this is your host Sapun Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us Varun Talwar, co-founder of the trade. Varun, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Sapun. Happy to be here. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about STO, which has you know advanced to graduate phase or status uh, at CNCF. Uh, of course, uh, we will talk about what it means uh, for projects like STO to get you know graduated. But before that, I would like to uh, uh, talk a bit about your own uh, history with the project. Today, I'm the co-founder of Tetrate, which I started in uh, March of 2018. My co-founder JJ. Uh, prior to that, I had a long stint at Google. Um, the last five years of which were in Google Cloud. So, uh, I was um, initially the product manager for GRPC, another CNCF project which uh, I was responsible for, which was uh, the modern RPC fabric. And that's now, uh, you know, very well adopted, you know, API project in the same foundation. Um, So really the idea of um, Istio came about from there. So while we were talking to companies about how they're adopting microservices and how different development teams are building their services in different languages and stacks of their choice and how it's becoming harder for them to uh, troubleshoot services, how networking between them is becoming an issue in terms of reliability. So the idea of Istio came about from those conversations. And so I was the founding product manager for Istio at Google uh we conceptualized the idea from the get go uh i was uh, also responsible to bring in um envoy as the another cncf project that people may be aware of as the you know data plane or the proxy within the istio project and uh, i was also responsible for getting um the rest of our partners around it namely like uh you know Lyft through Envoy, but also IBM uh, as the founding sort of, you know, partners into the Istio project and which was eventually launched in May of 2017 at Glucon. Can you talk about when we look at uh, service mesh, of course, there are a lot of projects and we also know a bit about the history where the whole uh, move to uh, uh, CNCF and all. I mean, it's, it's it's not that crowded, but there are a lot of service mesh project, and service mesh itself has evolved o- o- over over ever since you know it came into existence. So, first of all, I would like to just you know uh, to explain to the users you know the the role of service mesh in today's cloud native Kubernetes native uh, uh, world. Yeah, I mean, there is a <clears throat> reason that it's getting um, popular. I think. Um, if you, the problems that it solves are very uh, relevant and apt today as you adopt uh, more and more of a distributed services based architecture. So the problems are very, you know, simple in the sense of like, if um, once you adopt a distributed services based architecture, the networking becomes harder what becomes harder is who is responsible for failures in that networking. So if you and I are developing two microservices, initially we were in one code base. Now we are in two separate uh, code bases living in, you know, two different places. Um, Who's responsible when the network fails in between? Who's going to make sure that it's always reliable between us, right? Who's now that network is in between, how do we make sure that uh, no one intercepts requests in between and everything is encrypted going back and forth? Because otherwise we can have like man in the middle kind of attacks. Um, and then when something goes wrong, let's say end user has a latency and we are troubleshooting, is it my service? Is it your service? Is it the network in between? Uh, or is it the underlying compute? That kind of thing becomes harder, right? So those problems are very real. And when you take this, you know, what I was just explaining with two services to, you know, hundreds and thousands of services across multiple teams, you know, the problem just becomes uh, elevated. And uh, it is um, quite hard for uh, to 
every service owner uh, to encode all these cross-cutting logic into their own microservice. So for each of us to embed, you know, reliability logic, monitoring logic, TLS logic, security logic, uh, uh, retry logic into each of our microservices is expensive to write and expensive to maintain, right? So something that can, a dedicated piece of infrastructure that can abstract this out and developers don't have to write and organizations have a common way to, you know, control it via configuration is very promising. So I think that's a conceptual idea behind why everyone likes it. And uh, the more people are going towards uh, multi-cloud architectures, you know, uh, microservices architectures, which the world is going towards, the more this is going to become relevant. And, um, you know, it started off with, uh, Istio started off with a proof point on proving it out into one Kubernetes cluster, what it can do. And I think it now the space has evolved into enabling that to happen across their entire fleet of infrastructure. And that's frankly why, you know, I got motivated to start Tetrate as well. When you look at projects like Istio, which were already being used in production, what, is the, what does the graduation mean for the project, for the community, by community means, you know, folks who are involved with maintenance and also the whole ecosystem where folks are consuming it? No, it's a very important signal for end customers in terms of giving them comfort that this is mature, right? Like if you are the uh, executive in a big bank or a big telco trying to make a decision on adopting a technology, you want to make sure that it's mature, it's proven, it has, um, it is not a single vendor a backed project. It is not, uh, and it has a community of people around you like if you need it for support, if you need to hire people around it, which you will if you're betting on it, then uh, that ecosystem exists, right? Uh, and uh, so I think the graduation is a signal for end users to give them that comfort that they can adopt it and it's mature. Uh, the APIs are mature and they can rely on it. The reason it went, uh, as you mentioned, like it graduated fast is because you know, it already had a lot of adoption when it went into inception. Um, so sort of accelerated faster through the curve. Uh, it also, it also has a wide variety of, um, contributors and uh, around it. Like, I don't know the exact number, but hundreds of companies that contribute to it. Um, and, uh, you know, we as Tetrate, of course, you know, rely, uh, have a business around it. We are one of we are the largest contributor when you look at Envoy and Istio combined over the last like year or two years. So obviously we heavily help shape influence as Tetrate, uh, both Envoy and Istio as well. When you look at some of these open source projects, you know, Kubernetes is a good example. Linux kernel is a good example that is, they start with solving one specific problem. And you have been involved with the project uh, at initial phase. Uh, but as the project, you know, the adoption is growing, you know, and folks are like running into different kind of workloads, the scope of the project also grows. So talk about the role and the scope of service mesh or Istio in this case that you are seeing is kind of expanding. As I said before, Istio was um, a single cluster <clears throat> solution when it launched, right? Um, it's like you can, within a cluster, you can get a um, couple of aspects of security. Now you touched on security, which was primarily um, Auth N and Auth Z as it calls, or authentication and authorization, right? So any two microservices, I can do authentication, I can do authorization without having to like write code for it. Um, but as you look at organizations, especially large organizations, like obviously nobody has one cluster, right? Um, and everybody has uh, multiple of them. And the larger they are, they very likely have many of them in many different uh, public or private cloud environments. So the, and none of these services that they build live in isolation. They all talk to each other, right? Some will be in service mesh, some will not be in service mesh. So I think 
those are the uh, real environments for which uh, we try to solve for um, the idea for um, the project was around like uh, giving a notion of identity to a service which was a new concept at that time and you know still something that uh, people find very uh, you know uh, new to absorb which is the everybody is familiar with use end user identity but service identity is something that um, people you know find as a new concept and uh, so but really why this is a meaningful difference to security is because of that like service identity like uh, as code named by like you know which is uh, used uh, spiffy is the one that is used underneath within istio is sort of like uh, it's sort of the new ip address <laughs> uh, right because in a world of kubernetes and containers where um, you know things scale up and down in a world of cloud where auto scalers scale you know things up and down down to zero or scale to whatever is needed um ip addresses are no longer uh, very relevant as a noun and when it comes to access control rules when it comes to who is allowed to talk to what uh, so really you need a new uh, you know layer and nomenclature there and that's what uh, the underlying identity fabric is about right so therefore it's a meaningful shift in security um and um, then the cons- like the idea of like encrypting all the communication between all my environments is a very expensive exercise as i said before if developers try to do it via libraries so doing that in an automatic fashion is a is an extremely you know valuable thing and a step forward for security of organizations and then we take it to the next level in terms of access control right in terms of uh which service can access which other service in which environment uh in which region in which cloud uh and all these things are uh you know dynamic in a world where compute is dynamic like modeling all that is not easy so it's a very meaningful step forward in security as it relates to uh security of all the traffic uh and that's what obviously the project and space cares about um and i think that's why we see uh we are writing a lot of standards in this space like uh, we are writing with nist uh what microservice security really means we wrote 204 800 204a and b last year we just rewrote with nist uh as a trait uh the new zero trust security uh standard uh 80207a which is like the preferred standard for you know uh, zero trust environment so i think we're trying to educate both industry and community in terms of uh, this meaningful shift in uh, in my in security can you talk about how threat trade is kind of helping in lower the barrier of entry so organizations can easily uh, you know kind of embrace adopt these service mesh tools easily without having to compromise also we know that teams are getting smaller not everybody has expertise in everything so so talk about how you are lower the barrier of entry making it, making folks easier to deal with this complexity i think there are a few ways we are trying to help one is um the complexity is real because it's dealing with networking but it doesn't have to be exposed to all the people in the organization so few people in the platform team can deal with that complexity but the rest of the application teams and operations teams don't have to learn all that complexity can just be a consumer so that's one um technically how we are uh we enable that is um by having you know higher level of abstractions and apis and uh interfaces which are more familiar to those users so for example application teams are used to api specs and open api specs and if they can just be in their familiar land and just define their intent of what they want to do with their apis 
and the rest can be handled by the complexity of Istio under the hood, then they don't need to see it. Right? So that's one example of uh, how you sort of hide the complexity from the majority of consumers, right? Um, the second one would be like um, the same thing for, you know, operations teams. Like if they just need to um, troubleshoot issues between whether it's service or network or compute, like I mentioned, then they don't need to learn all the nitty gritties of 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 uh, the, the underlying Istio. The third thing way we help is we we generally recommend companies to go one use case at a time and one set of applications at a time, which generally makes it a lot more you know grokable and scoped exercise, and then they get the confidence of um, you know knowing the technology. In many cases, we recommend okay just start with an ingress gateway and don't disrupt your all your other microservices and that's an easier start it's less intrusive so there are ways and means in which you can approach the problem um, such that it's a um, lot more consumable one of the projects that we uh, talk about in association with the uh, uh, stio so risk mesh is of course uh, and why the proxy there uh, talk a bit about what is and why how are you folks are you involved with it and using it? I think Envoy is the uh, core engine inside uh, where all the traffic is flowing through. So if you look at Istio, it's two parts broadly. It's uh, Envoy, which is the data plane, which is where all the bits and bytes are flowing through. And the Istio D, which is the control plane, which is programming all these Envoys that are in the data plane. So just that's what... Um, the broad architecture is. Um, the Envoy is itself a very popular CNCF project. It's um, It's been there before Istio. Um, we decided to use that in Istio because of its, um, you know, modern, you know, code base, open in nature, and its support for all the modern protocols and APIs and so on. So we have been a, you know, as Tetrate, a heavy contributor to Envoy, one of we have been like the top three contributors to Envoy for many, many years since we started the company. Um, we are using it as our uh, data plane in all of the product offerings that we have. We also have, um, uh, you know, courses and certifications around it in our Tetrate Academy where people can learn what this technology is about. It's fully self-serve virtual courses that do exist and thousands of people have taken it. Um, now we are also extending um, Envoy to become um, um, on its own, like an inbuilt API gateway and load balancer for Kubernetes within Envoy itself. Because what we found is um, people were when they were adopting Kubernetes, they needed something at the front door. And uh, everyone in the community was building different versions of uh, Ingress controllers on top of Envoy. And cust end customers were like, should I choose X or Y or Z? And there was too many of them. And so we started this effort about two years back of something called Envoy Gateway, which is basically let's just build this into Envoy so people don't have this, you know, confusion and it's one thing in upstream is always you know more well maintained by a community of people so as the as a company we are also now advancing envoy gateway and really that's advancing the direction of envoy what kind of future we see of istio what are the things that the community you folks are working on i think istio will continue to see uh, growth um in especially in kubernetes environments <clears throat> Um, things that are being worked on are um, there is efforts to look at uh, sidecar less models for uh, places where you know sidecars are adding like either latency or resource costing or management headache. Uh, but I think the future is going to look like a mixed mode. Some places, so sidecars are here to stay, according to me. 
Um, and so we will see a mixed mode of somewhere there are sidecars, somewhere there are not. And I think that's a good directional advancement for the project. Obviously, you get some trade-offs of security and so on when you choose one or the other. But um, if I think companies and end users should have their choice. The other areas for advancement are around um, standardizing on gateway API. So as you know, Kubernetes has been working on the next ingress spec, which is the gateway API. And, uh, you know, both Envoy and Istio are working towards conforming to that. And that's a good thing because, you know, whenever, if if open projects can can have the base standard, then, you know, vendor products can build on top of the base. So uh, that's one other thing. The other areas are around um, performance and scalability as it's being getting used in larger and larger environments like fine tuning for even better scale and uh, performance at scale. I think that's just a natural uh, evolution, right? In terms of uh, as, as technologies go broader. Varun, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, talk about these service mesh and related projects. And of course, I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. Happy to be here.